Today, we are going to talk about love. And specifically, we're going to talk about black men's experiences with love and how that works and can be complicated by numerous things. For example, we may talk about how Quincy from Love and Basketball kind of gets a bad rap. Kind of. I'll play you. What? One game, one on one. <laughs> For what? Your heart. I can touch you no more. We're also going to talk about how a lack of pretty privilege in women is a lot like being broke if you are a man. No, no, no. I, I once heard my grandmother say, a broke man is like a broke hand. Can't do nothing with it. And lastly, we're going to try to dig into the complexity of how black men deal with love when they feel unwanted or unworthy of receiving love. So yeah, we're going to get kind of deep today. Hopefully I don't mess this up. This video is going to be focused most explicitly on the experiences of cis hetero black men. So as I know and value the fact that I have a diverse audience that appreciates a lot of the things I have to say, understand as you all know that this channel is made by a cis hetero black man and the overarching goal is to speak to that experience in a way that I don't think is present enough on YouTube. So please don't feel excluded. You are more than welcome to come and take a look. I'm Feek the Signifier. I'm a real life YouTuber now. So please remember to like, share, and subscribe to the channel and click the bell because when you don't click the bell, the gods of the algorithm do not hear my prayers. And this is the Black Media Breakdown. So, story time. I, I love my wife to death. My wife is amazing. I am incredibly lucky. But we got some, some interesting stories. Some of them are very embarrassing. Not all of them are embarrassing for me. Uh, but this one, not so much embarrassing. I like it. It's a cute story. Uh, and I wanted to start with it because I wanted to set the stage for what the type of energy I wanted for this video. So my wife and I met under relatively auspicious you know circumstances and the first kind of embarrassing thing is that when we met in undergrad um in 2004 i was a senior graduating and she was a freshman and we met in the second semester of my senior year and i initially did not like want to deal with her because i was like that's that's in bad taste i didn't want to be the guy in a fraternity you know picking up girls from the freshman dorm i my whole life at college made fun of those dudes but she was she was she was just kind of too bad she was that's my type i couldn't it's you know she, she was dope and you know i was a okay looking guy with a car <laughs> We kind of knew, or at least had it in our heads, that this was just gonna be a nice thing to do for a little while, because I was planning on leaving the state, so it did not seem necessary to make this momentary, you know, fun thing any more than just kind of a friends with benefits type situation. Plan changed, and I end up sitting at home, living with my mom, and it sucks. Uh, one night, out of kind of boredom and loneliness, I called her just to say, hey, what you doing? and we talked and to be you know embarrassingly honest it may have been the first like real conversation we ever had and then i called her the next night and then the night after that she called me and then suddenly pretty quickly we we're talking every day for hours that's what i don't know do y'all still do that the people under 30 like people in their early 20s do y'all still like well hold up do y'all still talk on the phone? I don't know, a couple of weeks before she came back uh, to school, I was like, hey, when you come back to school, can we officially be boyfriend and girlfriend? And she, of course, said yes, because, you know. But I didn't like fully get what was going on until she got there, until she came back to campus from uh, her hometown 
and I saw her for the first time in two, two, three months. And I remember so vividly because there's a, a dorm room uh, that she was staying in for, you know, this new year. And it had like this hallway that as a person was coming out, you could kind of see them walking. And I remember her walking down that hallway for the first time in however many months. And I was seeing her for the first time and I almost passed out in my car. Like I literally started like hyperventilating and blinking and like had to hold my breath and close my eyes to like compose myself. I was so nervous and excited to see her that it had a legitimate physical effect on me. And that feeling happened every time I saw her for about a year. And what's crazy is that this is a girl that I had been with, you know, been intimate with, and seen and talked to, and like all these other things for several months prior. But because we developed this like new emotional bond, my, you know, feelings toward her had completely changed and were just so intense in a way that I really didn't understand at the time. I call this butterfly season. It's that special time in any relationship where your mind and heart are awakening to a new reality of falling in love. And even though like that's not the most important part of maintaining, especially a monogamous relationship. My wife and I have a really good marriage and partnership, but we still have our moments because passion and love are fleeting. They don't feel the same. There's no way I could have that same excitement seeing her every day for the last 11 years that I had on that one day. But I always remember that day because when things get kind of rough and difficult, we feel disconnected that reflection on those feelings helps kind of pull me back into focus and to figure out you know how to work through whatever we need to work through in the moment recently though i've been thinking or wondering maybe about other black men's experiences with that feeling because like i don't think i'm unique i'm a little bit of a you know doughy sucker for love but like i can't be the only one but when I think about the way black men kind of conceptualize love or more significantly, the way black love for men is conceptualized in the media, it does feel like that piece of that puzzle is missing. So the question I had is how are other black men experiencing romance? Are they at all? How does that fold into the way black men experience love and relationships? And like, is there a disconnect between the media that is trying to portray that reality for us? To dive deeper into that, I reached out to the community because I didn't want it to just be about my experience because I don't know if my experience is unique or not. And to talk to just a handful of brothers about their experience with love from as diverse of a variety as I could muster because you know I'm only one guy and this isn't paid work. Well, it paid a little bit this month. Thank you, I appreciate that. A lot of times we hear about black men and relationships or more significantly the things that people desire in black men as it pertains to relationship. I feel like very rarely do we talk about love from a black man's perspective solely in the emotional aspect of that experience. And it begs the question why that is. And more significantly, if this is something that's not being presented in the media, at least from my perception, why might that be the case? Um, the very first one was when I was a young man, I was like 19, 20 years old. I, growing up, um, I didn't, nobody ever talked to me about love or how to treat a woman or, you know, any of those types of things. I mean, to a very great degree, I lost myself in that. I didn't, I know the language to express myself now, but at that time, again, I was 20 years old. I was just like, yo, this is it. If you would have asked me, yo, is this the woman for you? I would have been like, 100%. 20 years old, I'm ready. I don't want nobody else. This is it. And to start us out investigating that concept, I want to look at probably one of the most, you know, significant love stories, black love stories from my youth, which is the movie Love Jones starring Lorenz Tate and Nia Long. Love Jones is already special because it's got this indie vibe about it that very few movies had at the time, especially black movies. It's shot unconvincingly. Their romance is unconventional. Like everything about the movie is a little ahead of its time. But furthermore, the romance between these two characters for my dollar is one of the least 
Hollywood conventional romances that are out there, especially when you talk about black romance and especially from that era, which ironically was greatly shaped by this movie. In fact, so many movies that I'm gonna talk about after Love Jones only exists because Love Jones existed, if that makes sense. The best way I can kind of like describe it is imagine the photograph, but a little more messy because the thing about the photograph was it didn't have a lot of drama. But one thing I remember and appreciated on rewatch is how the men in this movie experience love in a way that is somewhat transgressive for black men at the time. They're vulnerable, passionate, but also petty and foolish and like all the things that come with love that I feel are kind of left out of the depictions of love for men. For example, Isaiah Washington's character Savan and his wife separate at the very beginning of the film. And we don't really know why or how serious it is, but it's depicted seriously. It's not played for comedy, which I feel like is a common trope that is fell upon for movies when they describe black men going through heartbreak. We are meant to understand that this is a complex and serious problem in his life. And he spends the whole of the movie processing this in the background. At the same time, Bill Bellamy's character, Hollywood, behaves in your typical boy fashion. And I mean, it's, it's Bill Bellamy, like that's kind of the only character he played throughout his career in Hollywood. The whole of his character is that after Darius and Nina break up, he decides that he wants to date Nina. But the way they depict it shows that the basis of that decision and behavior is really just insecurity and childishness and envy on his end. But most interestingly is Darius, the starving artist on the precipice, I guess, of a breakout. And he's managing the balance between his, you know, smoldering 90s sex appeal. Ask your mama if she had a Lorenz tape post in the room in 96, she probably did, and a vulnerable yearning for love. He plays like he doesn't have that in him, but everything about his performance is clearly a man seeking to have this level of intimate emotional connection that he sees with Neil Long's character, Nina. Darius hits butterfly season pretty early, right about... One more. I see not with the camera. Right. Let's see what you got. Take off your clothes. Take off your clothes. Take off my clothes. This moment like speaks so much to my spirit because men need to be challenged and desired. A lot of times the depictions of men and sex and just the, some of the things I hear, it, people think we're machines. And no, like moments like that, that's what gets you the type of attention you might be looking for under the circumstances. And it's right about here, from his point of view at least, that Darius is sprung. He is a goner for Nina, and much of the story is basically him trying to make sense of this feeling that he's unfamiliar with, but that he also can't deny. However, despite me claiming that it's unconventional, Love Jones does do the classic trope where the two characters in love need to become separated by some semi-stupid action on one or the other's part. And these barriers bring out one of the major themes that I found when looking at love from a black man's perspective, which is a balance or an imbalance between masculinity and vulnerability. The split between Darius and Nina, or at least the first split in the movie, is because Nina gets an option to go to New York with her ex-fiance. And it's pretty obvious from her character and performance that Nina doesn't want to go. However, in the spirit of f around and finding out, and just the classic trope of women listening to their single friends for relationship advice, she decides that she's gonna use this as a test for Darius. She asks him what she should do, understanding that in her head, if he tells her to stay, then she'll stay. And if he tells her to decide for herself, then she'll decide to go to New York. And of course, Darius tells her to decide for herself. It's just as obvious through Lorenz Tate's performance that this is not what he wants either. Again, he's in butterfly season, but he fears being vulnerable to his emotional need for Nina to stay because that lack of vulnerability connotes power. Something that isn't unique to black men, but takes on a unique form when intersecting with blackness and masculinity. Especially with women, you know what I'm saying? Like with men and friendships, I feel like when you have a, a good male friend, you know what I'm saying, your homeboy, you can kind of open up a little bit. Um, but with women, I feel like you're supposed to be this protector. And I feel like when you are open up, when you do open up or when you are vulnerable, it it kind of pokes holes in there. You know what I'm saying? Like, you have all these issues. Like, how are you going to protect me? You know what I'm saying? Or you're worried about your career. How are you going to provide for me? And now you're having a little bit more 
I don't want to say like a fight for power, but like uh, that whole like, can I, like if you're dating someone where they're like, are you really the guy for me? Or really can I like trust you to do your part or handle your role? One, like, like I was talking about Caribbean machismo earlier. We, I think are a lot less tolerant of feelings than Americans are. When it comes to it, we have very traditional ideas and understandings of what a man is supposed to be. The stress that comes from all of that, the stress that comes from, you know, being the planner, as people expecting you to have a plan, all with the things that you dealing with and everything like that, like, you know, my dad got said he needed a kidney transplant. Like, I mean, like I, I remember the things that like, I was dealing with around there and she would always remark, she's saying that, you know, I never feel like I know what's going on with you. What I see in this situation in real life is that a lot of black men fear losing their edge in these situations. That if they commit to full emotional engagement with a woman, they lose the veneer of masculine stoicism and that these women may in turn lose interest. Now you could blame Nina for playing games in the first place, which is completely fair. But again, I wanna focus on Darius and Darius feared that his emotional attachment to Nina might mean something negative in her mind if she saw it in his totality. Now, of course, at least according to the story, had he just followed his emotions, he'd have gotten what he wanted. Nina would have stayed, but that would have been a significant act of vulnerability. And many black men are taught to avoid vulnerability as much as possible. This makes me think of the term fragile masculinity and the way, in my opinion, it's severely misused in common parlance. Fragile masculinity is meant to refer to the anxieties that men have for upholding cultural norms and expectations for men. It's that anxiety that often leads men to sometimes ridiculous and bizarre behavior that we see and then make fun of and make memes about. And don't get me wrong, any man that says that he's not gonna wipe his ass because it's gay to touch your own anus, I'm perfectly fine with you making fun of that person. But we've memed the term so much that we've lost track of its original point and its original goal, which is to really speak to that sense of anxiety. The meme seems to imply that that anxiety is fabricated, that there's no reason for men to fear how society will treat them when they don't uphold masculine standards. And that's just not the case. When we expect Darius and other men to be vulnerable, we have to recognize that we are asking him to behave in a way that not only is very different than how he was taught to behave, growing up as a man, as a black man, but has probably also proven hazardous in his love life. We are asking him to believe and trust, not just that it won't be a mistake to get serious with Nina, who, let's be real, has a handful of red flags of her own, but also that by being vulnerable, he's not going to shed too much masculinity in her eyes and turn off her attraction to him in the first place. I think it's the fear of being vulnerable and then like it not being supported, I guess. Like, I, I feel like, you know, if you can't hold it together, then, you know, someone might be, and that's what is, you know, um, like a, a really scary thought. Like if I truly care about someone um, and I, I slip up or I, I, I fumble or I like break and then they're gone. I was never brought up in the like environment of, you know, a uh, black voice don't cry. You have to stay hard all the time and you can't show weakness because that's what people are going to like use against you and everything. I had to learn that from like the world. It contributed to the relationship aspect of things, uh, but it also it affected it in a way that I knew that I didn't want to maintain that artifice with somebody that I was going to be spending a lot of time with. Um, I noticed that some of my friends would get into relationships with these girls and they would just perform all the time. I love the use of the phrase artifice here because what it gets at is this veneer that black men often utilize to engage in and attract romantic partners. And it alludes to how black men maintain a safe emotional distance from romantic partners until they feel like it's safe for them to slowly and meticulously dismantle that artifice and be their true selves, which in some cases never actually happens. I'm gonna make a statement here that on one end oversimplifies a very complex issue and dynamic that creates conflict between men and women, especially black men and women. But on the other hand, it just really cuts the core of an issue that I don't have perfect answers for, but this observation 
I feel like has to be said. I think sometimes we forget that patriarchy is like a, a universal social system. And when you hear men talk about their experiences being vulnerable and sharing their emotions with women, and candidly, when you hear some women talk about their experiences dealing with emotional ass men, like, this isn't all that controversial of a statement. Now, I'm sure, of course, my progressive viewers are not of that ilk, you know, so feel free to go ahead and put in the comments how you've never had issues with men showing their emotions to you. But consistently, I've heard men talk about and have experienced myself that if a man is not showing anger or lust, any other emotion is sometimes met with confusion or denigration. Um, but even after the fact, we have to guard ourselves from it we can enjoy the conquest of of the physical and like the sexual nature of things and and we're taught to like enjoy that and to seek that out and to like you know get that thing specifically like you know that's that's the that's the mo of the patriarchy but the vulnerability that comes with it we're thought you know we need to reject that um and for us specifically just because we are so often put in these um these sort of like one size fit all ways of acting, ways of emoting and ways that we have to exist if we don't want any trouble, either from like within community or outside of the community. We all have to play this same certain game. We all know is messed up. And even in those situations where women are not like explicitly put off by their men's emotions, they sometimes just fumble the response. And that is a very delicate thing for a lot of men because we're already transgressing against our own upbringing. And if you drop the ball, speaking of dropping the ball, loving basketball, y'all. Y'all remember that one? Oh. It's stupid. You stupid, and your dad plays for the worst team in the NBA. What? Last time they won, Dr. J was a nurse. Shut up! I don't want to be your boyfriend anymore, you ugly dog. Why well, I want to be your girlfriend, you big head. So in Love and Basketball, we have Quincy and Monica, and they're childhood friends, and as expected with the trope, Monica plays the aloof sundere for the first chunk of their youth until eventually it's just Monica. However, unlike Darius and Nina, there is a very clear power imbalance between Quincy and Monica. Quincy has a very high status. It's probably as high as a black man can have in most general circles. And it definitely colors his worldview and the way he treats Monica. So as I go forward, understand Quincy is trash. Like I'm not about to deny that. However, trash people need love too. About halfway through the movie, some internal family drama erupts and Quincy's world is shaken to the core. And there's this very critical moment where he sits down and opens up to Monica. And Monica, let's be real, does not really value his emotional vulnerability and his need for her at this moment in time. The man looked me in my eye and he lied to me like it was nothing. Like, like he didn't even know I've seen people downplay this moment and focus solely on Quincy's subsequent fuckboy behavior, and I'm not here to justify that at all. But the thing that is missed is what separated Monica from all the other women, the women that have been throwing themselves at Quincy this entire time, is that in his head, him and Monica had a legitimate emotional bond, while these other women were mostly attracted to Quincy's artifice. And when that sense of bond is broken, Quincy like immediately pulls back from the relationship. And it seems extreme and it probably is, but to me, it makes perfect sense from Quincy's perspective. So he gets with Tyra Banks, you know, good old Tyra. But I also want to point out, he does it relatively responsibly. He breaks up with her and like in a really sad moment, she begs him after like he was cheating on her. Yeah, you know, this, this movie's not as good as y'all remember, trust me. What I want you all to get though, is that for Quincy's character, from his perspective, his personhood and identity has been intrinsically tied to his status as a golden boy and the son of a good man. I can't do this shit. Well, what does that tell you about using that word? Can't should never be in a man's vocabulary. And why not? Because when you say can't, you ain't a man. 
And when that identity is compromised by his father's misdeeds, everything about his identity comes into conflict and he fears having other people see him in this level of vulnerability. He has been operating in artifice for most of his life. And the only person that sees the man behind the curtain is Monica. So in this moment, and yes, this is a very imbalanced relationship where he needs her to come through for him emotionally and she doesn't, I get it. I get where he's like, you know what? Clearly this is not a thing that I can really do with her. And I commend him for breaking it off. And you see in his subsequent behavior that he commits wholly to just making his artifice as strong as possible. He goes on to deal with classically more feminine women and declares for the NBA and decides that he's going to reproduce his father's role of a man that he failed at and be a patriarch, but better. And that is the next topic I need to get into more. This idea that for a lot of black men, it's not really love or receiving love, it's access to an ability to perform a certain notion of patriarchal masculinity. Um, the role of a man, you know, if you want to go archaically, um, you know, stereotypically is, you know, provider, protector. Again, kind of gets you in the notion of suppressing or just either not validating or not kind of operating in your emotions. Similarly, um, in terms of being a protector, you know, if somebody starts shooting, I gotta jump in front of my woman or whatever and take the bullet for her. So there's like that expendable nature that you have to accept um, to be a protector. And that can again, make it so like, you know, damn, this could be my last day, you know, especially if you're actually serious about that. Um, you know, so you have to kind of have your mortality in the front of your mind, you know, or even suppressing your compassion for another human being. I don't want to hurt anybody, but if you're trying to hurt me or my woman, I'm going to fuck you up. I'm sorry. I did have like a couple of like friends that like have had children. They're like yeah. a couple years older than me. And like, just the, like you can see the switch in like mentality and like the social norms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is expected of you, and it really just like if you don't do those things like that you're expected to do from like your significant other or whatever like whatever the situation is, I feel like you're going to be seen as subpar or not adequate. Which in some cases that I mean that's you know the reality, but in some cases it's not. I don't think most people can easily explain why they fell in love with someone. But one thing I notice just from observing some of these conversations around black love when it comes to men is that a major aspect of strong attraction and love in these normative heterosexual relationships is the concept of role competency. Role competency is basically the ability for a person to perform a prescribed social role. A salesperson sells shit, a janitor is expected to clean. And in this case, a man in a heterosexual, classically gender relationship, which to be a leader and a patriarch and possibly help support a family and a community. I think that so much of what we understand love to be as men is attached to our ability to perform that role. This is to the point where there's tons of examples where a lot of men cannot experience or accept love if playing that role is not a core factor. One way to see this is in Sylvie's love from last year where we see Namdi Asamugawa's So, this is, uh, this is where I edit, and I just had to jump on real quick to say that uh, I've been saying Namdi Asamwa's name properly for years, for, for years, I've said this man's name right, but it, when it was time to get on camera, I'm John Travolta, clearly, so, yeah. Sorry for whatever's going on in the background. Rohan, wave hi. Character Robert and Tessa Thompson Sylvie strike up a relatively taboo romance because Sylvie's fiance is off to war. Immediately, one conflict is Sylvie's relatively upper class existence and Robert, who may or may not belong to the streets. This is a common conflict we see in a lot of black romances as writers understand that this is a relevant conflict in real life. 
The barriers keeping black men from certain status levels are absolute and make it so that black women seeking to love black men often have to be open to dating men who are not of the same socioeconomic status that they are, but we're gonna get to that later. Fast forward to the end and a lot of other drama and Robert is faced with the reality of not being able to functionally contribute to his household as a man. And when he realizes this, instead of facing Sylvie and giving her the choice of struggle love with him or moving on, he makes the decision for her pretty much out of pride, stating that he didn't want to drag her down. I can take care of things until something pans out for you. And what kind of man would that make me? Now, what this is getting at is he didn't see himself worthy of her love if he couldn't hold up his end of the bargain. Of course, by the end, they've worked it out, but the thing that isn't discussed is the long-term strain that might be caused in their relationship and his inability to perform that masculine role. The next time that they argue or disagree, is Sylvie going to resist turning this lack of role performance against him? That's something that we know is a possibility and it's something we see a lot in the media and a lot of men have experienced in real life. Um but it's interesting how, especially for men, black men especially, you know, when you touch on the fact that black men, if they don't feel like a provider, they feel literally less of a man because our worth is intrinsically tied to that. So if we're in a situation where, you know, our woman is, is actually providing, you know, even if we're down, let's say we laid off, let's say this and that, the power dynamic switches in such a way that it creates tension. And that's the reason why, like, I always took such uh, a very, like, cautious time when trying to get married with someone because in the Caribbean, we have marriage is very sacred, even though, like, this the idea being that if you're going to put a ring on a woman's finger, you have to be able to provide for them fully. You know, we, many of us have lived in that, you know, even if those, I think people that, you know, came out earlier in life, you know, even more, I think, you know, in, even if we speak to like the younger generation, just where it's more the norm to come out a lot earlier. There's still, I think, we still deal with the heteronormative definition. So like you said, the gender roles. And I think that's where a lot of times those relationships tend to go south because we automatically think somebody has to step into more of the masculine role. Somebody has to step into more of the feminine role. Again, I mean, even as a, you know, self-identifying gay man, like that's not, the stereotypes is where it starts to become problematic, right? When we're not showing up as our authentic self for whatever reason. And this is not to insinuate that role competency isn't important with women. Women are expected to take care of the home and submit and be classically feminine and maintain acceptable levels of beauty at all times. And like this, I know all these things, there's definite angst around the performance roles for women. Patriarchy is shitty. We kind of know the deal. However, from my perspective, we at least have the language to problematize all those internal conflicts with women. But for men, especially black men, and here's like one of the big things that came out of this, is that we really haven't begun to be critical of the status quo. Chris Rock in his most recent comedy special from maybe this time last year, helped crystallize the angst that causes in black men. Only women, children, and dogs are loved unconditionally. <laughs> Women, children, and dogs are loved unconditionally. A man is only loved under the condition that he provides something. Okay? I've never heard a woman in my life say, you know, after he got laid off, we got so much closer. <laughs> now you may disagree with this, but like, you can't disagree with how people feel. Right now, Chris, like a lot of other comedians of a previous era, has his problems. But one thing he's always done is effectively speak to the angst of black men in relationships for good or for ill. I've heard many black men speak to this experience of wanting unconditional love and lamenting the persistent requirement of having to be of a certain economic status to access that love. And it's something I think a lot of men struggle to effectively express and explain to women, partly because pride makes them just say it in the most vitriolic and misogynistic ways, but also because it's very transgressive and emasculating for them to admit in the open. Now, I wanna be clear as I get into this, that this isn't an endorsement for struggle love or for women to lower their standards to love men who do not meet their expectations and needs or requirements for intimate partnerships. But 
what I'm trying to promote is that we need to at least open up the discourse on the feelings and experiences of these men. A little while back, a YouTuber named O Steph Cole, I think is how you say her name, made a video about lacking pretty privilege and how that sucks. And it's a really interesting watch. Basically in the video, she describes her experiences in the world as a woman who lacks the intrinsic social currency and privilege of being seen as attractive by the outside world and all the ways in which pretty is an advantage to pretty women, while she as a not so pretty woman, her words, not mine, has never really had those experiences. And the core of her video is really her just sitting in that space and energy and processing it and exploring those feelings and what those feelings mean to her. It's a very intimate and revealing look into that, something that I think really needs more attention and I commend her for it because it took a lot of bravery and vulnerability for her to do that. At the same time, she said some things in the video that I thought were very revealing in regard to this blind spot for how black men go through a similar struggle, but the narrative around it is almost rendered completely invisible. When I would go on a date, the guys would be so down bad, that made someone really upset in the comments, that I knew I couldn't even expect for them to buy my dinner. I definitely have extended, I've dated men who were just straight up unemployed. I've dated men who were unemployed with no cars, suspended life, like I have extended the compassion. But wouldn't it be so nice, hallelujah, if instead of me extending, I could be met where I'm at. I want somebody who can meet me halfway and a pizza delivery driver can't do it. And the only reason why I was even doing all that stuff is because I had a vision for where I wanted my life to be at the time. When you meet a new girl, what do your friends ask you? What she look like? Ladies, when you meet a new guy, what do your friends ask you? What does he do? What the fuck does that nigga do that can help you out? Can this motherfucker facilitate a dream or not? What's going on once again, y'all? This is uh, me coming from my highly professional editing bay, as you can see. Um, the kids are not here right now because school started. But anyway, I wanted to jump on camera because I know that the internet is a cesspool of awfulness and that there is a strong chance, especially if this video reaches a large audience, that there will be people in the comment section that see that last snippet as a green light to go in on their issues and complaints about black women and black women do this and black women do that. That snippet itself is a response to somebody talking about Kevin Samuels and her comments on her video. And so because I don't want that and I don't want my intent to be misconstrued, I wanted to make sure I clarified exactly what I wanted to come across from that clip and exactly why I used it. I don't have any issues with O. Steph Co. or any black woman's desire to find the type of love and companion that they seek. I am not an endorser for a struggle love. I think I say that like, a, I said that so many times this video, I cut some of it out. And I just wanna say it again, I am not endorsing struggle love or trying to claim that black women need to lower their standards in any way that they don't see fit. The reason why I took that snippet out is because what I think Ostefko did and what a lot of people do, not just black women, but people in general, is they don't recognize the very, to me, obvious parallels under a capitalist patriarchal system between intrinsic value of beauty and a man's access to capital and status and money and economic, you know, whatever. In the same way that old Stefko feels like she is suffering for her lack of pretty privilege, there are a lot of black men who are suffering for their lack of access to the tools they need to increase their status, to increase their income, to escape from poverty. And what I want, what the goal of, you know, this section and really the totality of the video is to create space for black men to have these conversations amongst ourselves and with everyone else to not make it about trying to break black women down, but to just speak to that experience. I feel like I'll never see a video by a black man saying I'm broke and I can't find love and that sucks. Like you would never see the counterpart video. And that's because we don't feel safe or empowered to have that conversation. And really the main thing I'm trying to show is that there's so much synergy between the pain points between us, way more than we often understand and way more than we conceptualize because 
we are too comfortable endorsing the status quo when it comes to black men. So that is the goal of that snippet. I hope that comes across, but knowing how the internet works, who knows? Either way, back to the video. So I point out this little snippet not to be critical of her or really any women that feel that way. I didn't marry a person that was below my standards. I don't think anybody should build a person that's below their own standards. Do what makes you happy. But the thing I just want to enter into the conversation is that we really need to think a little bit more about how much status and money affects the way black men experience being able to access love, partnership and intimacy in the same way that we problematize white supremacists and racist beauty standards that contribute to the experiences and difficulties for black women. We need to apply that same lens to black men who we know are systemically excluded from education, over policed, over arrested, over incarcerated. We are far too comfortable siding with the status quo in regards to black men. Like for so many of these men, the only place where they've ever felt unconditional love is their mom. And even that's a trope. Guys, happy Valentine's Day, sweetie. And you too, mom. <laughs> I'm just gonna leave you two alone. I'll call you. Or not. We'll be guy. They've got to learn to be. Mom, this is Sabrina. You raised a wonderful man. One big happy family. Well, I wish I could say the same about you and your daughter. If it wasn't for my mother, I wouldn't be the man you want to marry. If it wasn't for your mother, I wouldn't be questioning if you're the man I want to marry. Going back to Chris Rock, he starred in a barely remembered film called I Think I Love My Wife that although flawed and also again, not aging well, but I remember it vividly because it was one of the first movies I ever remember that centered explicitly on the emotional needs of a black man as its core story conflict. And I think it's actually a relatively solid depiction of the type of emptiness that some men face, especially black men, when they have to like weigh out the value of love and emotional connection with being able to access and play a man's role, which is something that black men value highly, partially because it's something that we're told we'll never be able to experience. And this wasn't that feeling of, I guess I will never find X, I guess, you know, the, uh, the entire um, kind of the deal for men outside of color in the patriarchy is, hey, if you do X, Y, Z and adhere to this guidelines, you know, you'll probably be guaranteed, you know, your subservient uh, female counterpart and uh, your own sort of house and like, you know, just getting that your, sort of- Your feudal state. <laughs> exactly, you know? And as you grow up, you kind of see like how, you know, just like misguided and completely just wrong and, and gross, that sort of like- And also unfulfilling. Is one thing exactly it's coming out it's in the media but we don't problematize it i'm going to talk about that a lot in the video but a, a, several of the men have talked about like the sense of loss of your black man in america and so you're already told that you know it's highly unlikely you'll ever get to that you know patriarchal dividend and then mm -hmm. you guess that your whole life and you get it and then it still doesn't work and, and something's missing and you think it's yourself. Rock plays Richard Cooper, a highly successful lawyer or something, I, I don't really remember. And he has this idealistic life, a beautiful wife and kids, but there's a problem. His wife isn't having sex with him. It's never fully engaged with why this is happening in the movie. There's a lot of reasons why long-term partners stop having sex with each other. Many of those reasons Richard seems to be exhibiting, like not helping around in the household, focusing only on professional work and playing that provider role without really thinking about the need for engagement and emotional connection with your spouse. But the movie also does show him trying to do the appropriate things to communicate his need for physical intimacy to his wife and doing better in those areas and it still doesn't work. Meanwhile, an old female acquaintance played by Carrie Washington comes along in butterfly season. And the thing the movie does well, I think, is paint the picture that Richard isn't really just hard up for sex in terms of carnal release, that he's looking for that emotional and physical intimacy. Like we let so many bad tropes become like canon for men as it pertains to sex. The men only think about one thing and men think about sex every eight seconds. None of this is fucking true, yo. Nikki doesn't have this problem. He's physically attracted to Nikki, but more than that, he is connecting with her. She's challenging him, she's listening to him and reciprocating his attraction and forcing him to move at her speed. 
Speed boy. Speed in the dish. Come here. Okay, it's gonna get it. Oh, look at this. Oh. Fast forward to the end of the movie, there's been a lot of hijinks and other stuff, and Richard is deciding that despite the way he feels, he wants to disconnect from Nikki and focus on re-sparking his marriage. But when things really don't work out and he's faces his one last chance to be with Nikki, he decides he's gonna take it. But right before he hits the point of no return, he changes his mind after being reminded of his role as a father. And with that, he leaves Nikki not having fully crossed the line and returns home. Now, this is meant to be like a righteous and happy ending, but what's interesting is that the happiness that Richard is supposed to experience is an emotionally dysfunctional marriage where he feels disconnected from his wife, but he gets to still be a husband and a father that his need for physical intimacy and emotional connection is not necessary for him to be happy. And that just like happened and nobody blinked. It's that status of husband and father that Richard decided was worth enough to keep from cheating. And I'm not endorsing cheating or endorsing leaving a family or a wife or a child for the sake of pursuing something you think is better. I know that divorce and being separated from children can be devastating for men. I'll get into that a little bit later, but the movie really cops out on resolving the actual conflict that Richard was having. When Richard went home to sing this silly ass song, Lord, I just need to know, There was no guarantee that the problems that he was experiencing in his relationship were going to be resolved. And I think that's so profound and something that I just, I don't think enough people think about that the emotional needs of black men can often become very subservient to their ability and capacity to playing those roles. Um, you know, this, this language that we're talking about right now is something that, um, it's vocabulary that I am, um, that I'm in, in that I'm in the process of building and molding. Um, if you, if we would have had this conversation two years ago, you know, right before I turned forty, um, I don't even know if I, I would have had the, you know, the, the language to speak on this. I, I, I speak for myself, but um, I talk to enough men with a um, an organization that I found it called a Nugal where. We're starting to have these conversations more and more. What does love look like? It's, it, it, I think it's first even defining, right? It was a while that it took me to even understand for me, for Jamel, what does love look like, right? How do, how do you wanna be loved? Um, and I think if you talk to, I'm guessing, if you talk to the average um, specifically black man, we don't even give ourselves the amount of the time that's allowed to kind of really dig into think those thoughts. Works. I feel like all of American culture only really responds to them two emotions in black men specifically. If you are happy, people gonna look at you like, what mm. are you so happy for? <laughs> yeah, what are you so happy about? Why are you grinning and happy and skipping and shit? What's wrong with you? You know what I'm saying? If you are sad, people gonna be like, oh, what's the, what now? You know what I'm saying? What, what's the problem? The only things that people are gonna be like, okay, this I know how to deal with, anger, lust. That's it. It's unfortunate, but it is the way it is. Any of these like Facebook dating groups or like vacations or anything like that for every, I mean, 90% of the posts are like battles of the sexes, you know, controversial posts to kind of get a reaction, you know, one way or the other, you know, versus the guys or versus the girls. And there's always this who hurts you thing. Mm. And I always kind of laugh at it because I feel like we're all hurt. That's why we're here. That's why we we single after college or after undergrad. All of us are, are hurt in some way. That's why, you know, we're not with our college sweetheart. We're not with our high school sweetheart. Something went left somewhere, and now we let, you know, we the ones left trying to figure it out. And that's only when brothers like are aware of that. Because there's plenty of times where men are so caught up in playing that role that it's them that neglects to emotionally and intimately connect with the other peoples in their family or their partners. You may or may not be familiar with the show Ayala Fix My Life, which is like black Dr. Phil adjacent. Like it's mostly, it's, it's really exploitative, but you know, it's entertaining. And they had a family on there where the guy went viral a few years back for this really over the top speech he gave to his daughter and his daughter's boyfriend maybe about what a real man is. I've been married to my wife for 
18 years, going on 19 years. Blue My wife fellas. has never paid a mortgage payment. She's never paid a gas bill, electric bill. She's never paid a cable bill. She's never had to pay insurance for her cars. I pay for all that, but that's what a fucking man does. I have always hated any phrase that starts with a real man blank or a real woman blank to be fair, but like, ugh. So like I immediately hated this video and you know, didn't think anything of it. But lo and behold, some years later, he's on Ayala Fix My Life and his whole family fucking hates him. Are you an abused woman? If I stay, I'm gonna die. Your kingdom is in ruins. I can't say that I'm like all of you. You know you can't oh, me. Oh, ugly ass back to Ohio. And now Yala works through things with them and you know, they, they, he gets it back together. But the thing that comes out is that he as a black man never had modeled to him what a man of the house really looks like. And black men are so inundated as boys and children with negative messages about who they are and what they're capable of, that for those of us who do have the capacity to do better, we get really like gung-ho over resisting that narrative. And we fight and fight and fight in the, for the lucky ones of us, the relatively few that get there, we're like, yeah, see, we made it, we did it. Y'all told me I wouldn't get here. But for a lot of those men at the same time, once they get there, they realize that that classically patriarchal role isn't as fulfilling as they might have been told. And it can cause a lot of problems. And so some of these men get lost in that role competency. And that's not unique to black men, right? Like that was the overall arcing story in Fences, but also a doll's house. It's a byproduct of a social system that doesn't cultivate in men an understanding that they deserve and are capable of full humanity and emotional wellness. For a lot of these films, when I think about a lot of the films that at least I grew up on and, you know, it's probably still happening a lot today, but I can't call it. The love for black men is much less about emotional connection with a woman and more about them deciding what type of men they want to be. And this is a legitimate thing to investigate, of course. But again, where's the love? Where's the butterfly season? Where's the engagement with black man's emotional needs? A man. I, I feel like what we were based uh, or what we were taught was that men provide, period. Full stop. If you can't do that, and not just for you, if you provide for you is whatever, you got to give to other people. That's what makes you a man. So, I mean, the truth of the matter is that statistically women are, at least at this point, more educated, making more money, property owners, business owners, you know, the, the stats go on and on and on. So it's like uh, the whole um, submissive piece. <laughs> Dudes that ask for that kind of thing or actually want that from a woman, to me, have not really been around no women because plenty of women would love to hand over all of that responsibility and follow your ass and just do whatever it is that you're trying to do. But you have to demonstrate that you are capable of driving the ship and not running it up on the beach and if you come in and you don't know what you're doing your life is not together you, you're asking for a lot you know dating has been interesting because like my ex-girlfriend really didn't know crap about me she didn't know any you know and didn't take the time to get to know me uh and which was kind of uh, disappointing uh, I can't say upsetting because they say anger is not a primary emotion um but yeah it was just like who gives a fuck <laughs> you got money you got a house <laughs> you got a car uh you're doing well you're educated you got a you know solid job with benefits you know who needs to know about your past or you know what your hobbies are or what makes you happy or what your struggles are or whatever and that kind of segues into the opposite end of relationships the actual end when butterfly season is over when the love is gone and when the connection is diminished or more likely forever severed because of the way that you know we are uncomfortable dealing with black man's emotions especially ones of hurt and loss from love it's more common and comfortable for people to play that for laughs i need to be held i need you to rub my back Put me in my onesie. Whatever you need to do, baby, I'm yours. Going back to Love Jones, after the initial breakup where Nina leaves from New York, Darius attempts to open up to his friend about his heartbreak, but
before eventually checking out in fear of judgment. And like many men, black and otherwise, decides that it's safer to channel his negative emotions into a bottle. He again fears being vulnerable, even though he's with some of his closest male friends, because he is still scared of losing that sense of masculinity and status. Also, harking back to the video about Lawrence and Insecure and how after his breakup with Issa, he did try to be vulnerable to his male friends and they gave him pretty shitty advice. So sometimes it's just a double-edged sword, because even when a man maybe has the courage to reveal that vulnerability to his closest friends, if they aren't capable of engaging with that effectively, as many men are not, it's you know a lose-lose situation. However, we know that heartbreak in men is real and you don't need a 90s R&B album to speak to this. I won't be able to speak too much about like the experience of being poly because I'm relatively new at it. Mm -hmm. um, it's more of an approach to like the framework of my relationship at the moment. Whenever I was with somebody, even if I really cared about them, over time, some things would change. And just like, I was losing women that I really cared about and like were basically my best friends it's because I had gotten into this contract that I no longer found the terms agreeable because I don't really, I don't bond with people very easily. So I would lose them and I wouldn't talk to them anymore. I didn't, I didn't like that, so. Um, and then with my, uh, my ex now, that I have my children with, it was like, you know, I felt like, hey, I am a provider. I am a protector. I'm a good father. I'm all of these things. And yet I still can't get this relationship to work. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm I'm checking all of these boxes and this is still not enough. And and it was the heart I mean the heartbreak was there, but it just was like more frustration. Like, how, how does this not work? Like, I'm doing everything that I need to do. And we knew, I say, okay, we know we want each other. After we came back from the breakup, it was the test that, it was the bond that brought us together. Like, we knew what we wanted at the end of the day. You know, I understood the physical pain and, and uh, the toiling of desire of someone. I felt literally empty. My chest, she was like literally a shortness of breath in my chest. Every time when I think about her, literally there was a vacancy in me. And I said, you know, at one point I was just like, you know what, it makes no sense for me to hurt myself to not be with this woman. You know, at the end of the day, I'm feeling this and this is that, this is the reversal of that butterfly season that you're talking about. It's the pain. Like, so there's already enough drama about not being able to play that patriarchal role. But on those occasions where a failed marriage or partnership happens, it's not just like losing a person, it's also loss of identity, loss to the access of this very elusive role for black men, and it can be devastating, and I don't think we give enough credit to that. And maybe within a year, I met the woman that was gonna become my wife. Um, we dated for about three years, uh, conceived our first child, who is now about to turn 18. When we broke up, so we had by the time we were separated, it was about 10 years of our relationship in total. So when we broke up, I didn't know, by this point I was almost 30, yeah, something like that. I didn't have a concept of who I was outside of father, husband, family man, so on and so forth. So if you were no longer married, if you were no longer on a day to day with your kids or whatever, who are you? You know what I'm saying? So, and that's kind of the thing that drives the point of this video. As I look at the world of social media and the incredibly toxic discourses, like I, I did not know, like I knew about, you know, certain people who I've mentioned before, but I didn't know about the whole breadth of awfulness between certain online communities of men and women. And just like, yeah, like, wanting to like provide i don't know commentary on the topic of love for black men that didn't require me to shit explicitly on black women and blame them for the problem at hand and although there is definitely like conflict between black men and black women that both parties have to kind of work through part of that working through comes from being more critical of where black men sit in this particular problem space and the reason why we have to work through that is because like it's like we're trying to balance a math equation but only working on a one set of numbers and that the situation that black men are in that status quo 
is supposed to not change somehow and has like that assumes that it's already been working almost if that makes sense and we know that it's not because in my opinion our inability to acknowledge this is what is really causing a lot of the problems between black men and black women and especially on black men's behalf is limiting their access to love one thing I've heard a few times in like these conversations and just general side conversations with other black men is that black men in relationships really just want respect. And when you think about that, as I say that out loud, that's really kind of sad. It's a clear indictment on the state of the world for black men as a whole, because when I hear respect, I feel like I'm hearing a plea for unconditional love, a love that fills them up and isn't transactional or contingent on maintaining or performing a role as patriarch. Because innately, although many men seek out that role, the main purpose of that role from a man's perspective is to be worthy of receiving love in the first place. That's how patriarchy teaches us. And then conversely, a chunk of the vitriol and toxicity around black male female relationships stems from black men's fear and angst at not being able to perform that role yet still desiring the love attached to it and that's why you hear crazy shit like black women are too educated and too focused on their career and like that's nonsense it's literally like what's happening here is that there are men who are broken down by society and lonely in that regard and so their response to that if they think they need a partner their goal is to break that partner down until they seem like a viable partner themselves which is And it's like we're doing all this work to combat white supremacy, but we still haven't arrived at disentangling it from the way we love each other. And good luck with that, y'all, because I'm fucking married. Good, you know. By the way, the extended interviews for the men, which like were great, like I had some great conversations with these brothers. That's gonna be uh, Patreon only, you know, content. So please, if you are interested, check out the Patreon in the description or somewhere on my site. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Please, please, please check me out on Instagram and I guess on Twitter. I think my Twitter's up there. I don't tweet much, but I will. If, if y'all are there, like if y'all are there, I'm gonna come, right? Uh, that, that's it, that's it. Appreciate y'all. Peace.